Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to Grand Rounds uh, today. Uh, today I have the pleasure of introducing and actually uh, reintroducing uh, Dr. Michael Viktorov. Uh, Dr. Viktorov is board certified in family practice and uh, clinical informatics and uh, is uh, currently a clinical professor uh, in the Department of Family Medicine at the University of Colorado and also a risk management uh, consultant for COPIC. And as you may recall, he provided us with a, uh, a great grand rounds a few weeks ago regarding the potential risks and benefits of the cell phone in the exam room. Uh, he has uh, kindly accepted our invitation to join us virtually again today uh, to review with us uh, uh, the causes of medical errors. And please uh, join me in uh, welcoming Dr. Michael Viktorov. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, sound check. Hope everything works. Um, uh, and uh, the, the introduction is done. Uh, I, I'll tell a, a very brief story. Uh, and then I think, are, are you in charge of showing the slides or do I need to uh, toggle? OK, who knows? Um, I'm assuming that you're seeing slides. Uh, the, many years ago, uh, I was involved in um, uh, one of those uh, disciplinary uh, boards that uh, was hunting for bad doctors. And at the, at the time, this was, this was many years ago, um, we had two uh, crimes that we could accuse doctors of committing. Uh, one was called uh, gross and flagrant and the other was called substantially substandard in a substantial number of instances. And uh, I wrote that time to uh, the person who was the Secretary of Health, and I said, uh, hey, you made me a judge in court with two crimes. You know, we had murder, arson, and you're fine. And, and I said, well, you know, really there were more things than that, uh, that doctors do wrong. Um, uh, would you like to see a list? I've, I've started a taxonomy of uh, medical errors. And, and they, of course, said, no, thank you. Uh, but I persisted, and I went on and, and wrote a list of some hundred things that I thought doctors to, could do wrong. And um, I took it at that time to the World Health Organization and the CDC and the FDA and the AMA and the ABC and the CIA and everybody. And I said, hey, look, I have a list of, of the medical errors. And, and nobody really was very interested back then. Uh, in, in fact, actually, I learned many years later that the FDA adopted that as, as part of its uh, adverse drug experience uh, recording system. But uh, nobody else really did until uh, the Institute of Medicine wrote its uh, book, uh, To Err is Human, um, in around the year 2000. And uh, then suddenly everybody had a, a taxonomy of error, and we were coding errors like crazy. We had classifications and uh, all sorts of systems for, for counting and measuring errors. And the amusing thing, of course, was uh, that uh, none of these could be cross-mapped to each other. So we had a dozen siloed systems of, of error counting, and that is actually still the system we have today, despite the efforts of... Um, uh, the Agency for Healthcare uh, Research and Quality and, and other kinds of organizations. Um, so I want to talk about not just uh, naming the errors, uh, but uh, the issue of um, uh, uh, causation. Uh, whoops, my um, device for moving slides isn't working. I'm going to step aside for one second. Hopefully you're looking at slides. Um, Okay, so uh, error science is old. Aristotle uh, said there were four ways to look at the cause of something, and we won't go into all of this. It, it's ancient history, uh, but uh, my principle of looking at the epidemiology of medical mistakes is that you can't count anything if you can't name it. And so what we need is the name of the things that we do wrong if we're gonna do science on them. You, know, you could imagine uh, let's do, um, you know, virology, except we won't know what the names of the viruses are. Well, uh, that isn't going to get us anywhere in epidemiology. Uh, so usually when I start um, talking to uh, students, residents, or, you know, anybody about, well, what do you think is an error? I begin by uh, 
uh, asking everyone to go into their own mind. And this is actually a harder exercise than uh, uh, some people uh, uh, think. Uh, think of something you did wrong. Uh, something uh, you uh, uh, can remember, uh, you, you either personally uh, committed or you were standing next to and you observed or were involved in something you heard of. Um, and, and you'll find right away that actually this exercise is a bit difficult. Uh, I've done this in uh, groups of, you know, hundreds of doctors, and it's amazing how, you know, even people like me who have been making errors for, uh, you know, 40, 50 years, uh, have a hard time uh, doing the mental exercise of, well, let me, okay, let's think of something I did wrong. Uh, and there are very important psychological reasons for that, uh, why we block that. But uh, let's move on. We'll get to those. Uh, let's just first think about what would it be if we had to define error. This is the the, the first um, intellectual challenge. And I have it on authority, but not Don Berwick's authority, um, that uh, he defined an error as something you wish didn't happen. Uh, well, that's a bit general. Uh, it isn't going to work well enough for science, but it's a good start. Um, Lucian Leap, of course, has done some of the earliest and best work in what's wrong with medicine. And he calls it an uh, unintended act, something that doesn't achieve its outcome. Okay, good. Uh, there's this wonderful person named uh, Reason, Professor Reason. I love these British names, um, who defined error two ways. He said it's the failure of a planned action to be complete as intended. That's, that's pretty good. So he he called that execution or wrong plan, error of execution, error of planning. He also used this definition, a deviation in the process of care. And remember, reason is the guy from whom we get the Swiss cheese model. He, he says there are many barriers to an error trajectory, you know, creating harm. Uh, and in order to create harm, an error has to pass through several holes in a Swiss cheese that are aligned. Some folks have... Uh, used a much narrower error uh, that relies on a standard of practice, a guideline. And so it's a deviation from standard. And um, th that gives us trouble in the um, uh, medical risk management business because we know that sometimes people can be depart from standards on, for very deliberate reasons, right or wrong, uh, but uh, it, simply variance may not be uh, error in the sense I need. Um, Here's a couple of guys that, that called it a, they tried to throw everything in the kitchen sink, right? It's an act or omission, uh, it, it, uh, of omission or commission in planning or execution that contributes or could contribute, right? It just means we didn't like the result. Um, and then Reason returns to us again, uh, Professor Reason, and he identifies yet another uh, kind of error, which he calls latent error which means um, the possibility that something will go wrong upstream and then there will be a trickle down effect uh, to people lower in the causa causation change, uh, chain. Uh, we're gonna look at all of these a bit, um, as well as uh, this process, which is not really uh, defined. It's, a, it's, it's not really error per se, but we, we call them errors when we have a near miss. It would be something that was potentially a disaster, but was rescued before uh, the final outcome. Well, Reason created this generic uh, kind of modeling system, and it, uh, like all systems, it, it has flaws. But the things that we take away from this in medical risk management are that there are really kind of different uh, processes, different in kind. Uh, that produce mistakes or adverse outcomes. And he called those slips, lapses, mistakes, and violations. Um, and there, there are definitions for these. You know, a motor slip, you, when you cut the wrong artery, that's a slip. When you forget something, it's a lapse. When you use the wrong plan, it's a mistake. And uh, now we can look at some violations. Okay, so what would be a violation? And I have pretty slides, you know, funny things. These are safety violations. Um, 
you know, some of the, I think this one looks really fairly real. This looks too real. Um, some of these may be posed. I don't know. Some of them are deliberately ironic. Here's one I actually think is Photoshopped, but it doesn't matter because it's funny. Um, and now I want to show you something, uh, a, a slightly different uh, approach that I show the residents usually when I'm teaching about uh, error management. Um, I'm a, a firearms instructor, sort of on the side, and I want to show you uh, something. I, I show my firearm safety class. This is uh, like a 10 second video. Okay, so uh, when we pause at this point, the, the challenge that I want to throw in front of you is, how could that happen? And, and when we're uh, analyzing adverse events in healthcare, um, a lot of times we, we sort of begin with the question, well, how on earth could that happen? Um, you know, here we, this is a, a a malfunction of, uh, of ammunition that's called a hang fire. It's very rare. But uh, this shooter in this case uh, was at least fairly experienced. He was operating independently. And he should have known, right, that there is no information to be gained by looking down the muzzle of a rifle. That is not an effective diagnostic maneuver for for any purpose. And, and not only that, it violates a couple of very important precepts, like don't point this at yourself. And yet this is an exemplar of a lot of stuff that goes wrong in healthcare, not, maybe not the majority of errors, but very often we get on the phone and we listen to an incident report, you know, oh, well, you know, I, I, I operated on the wrong side of the body, or, you know, for example. And we asked the question, how could you? And that's, what I, that's where we're going here today. I want to ask this question of how could you um, and get away from what I think is a, a, an unhelpful kind of categorization of, well, you're just dumb, right? You're an idiot. You don't know something. Knowledge gap, knowledge deficit, motivational, moral deficit. It's way more complicated. So if we um, go back to Professor Reason, and by the way, this is his old book from 1990, and you should all read it because it's kind of interesting in a you know, human factors analysis uh, way. His estimates, which we don't want to take too seriously, but they're, they're uh, sort of qualitatively, intuitively persuasive, that a lot of errors in medicine are skill-based, uh, a minority, but a substantial minority, are uh, violations of rules or choosing the wrong rule. And only 11 percent, in, in his estimation, um, were actually based on an error of a reasoning pathway, you know, some logic reasoning uh, principle, which is sort of interesting because when you, when you uh, listen to medical education, um, you know, the Society for uh, Medical Decision Making, that sort of stuff, uh, the, the focus on diagnostic error is very often um, predominantly on how do we avoid cognitive bias and work our way through uh, knowledge pathways, uh, when actually the things that go wrong in, in healthcare may not be, um, well, you just didn't know um, uh, how the pulmonary circulation works, uh, for example. Um, we're all familiar with this, no reason to, to dig deeply here, that there are um, active and passive errors, right? N not doing something you should or doing something which you shouldn't. We all know that. But if you, if you look at some of these subcategories, um, you see that the cause uh, is not simple for some of these uh, uh, simple lapses. 
And, and so we, we want to talk about causes, and I'm, I'm not going to spare uh, you from one of my biases that um, there is some evidence that production pressure, um, psychological factors uh, in institutions, and uh, systemic pressures, we're not talking about systems failure, you know, systems of care failure, that we'll get there, but we're talking about um, workplace culture uh, seems to be a very large factor in why people go wrong. And so I'm going to maybe dwell on that more than is comfortable. Well, but just uh, backing up, uh, you know, thinking about what we have in healthcare now, and especially um, the, the question of whether electronic information systems and other sorts of technology uh, can actually be helpful to us. Um, what we would have to ask is, well, how do those technologies interface with the, the causal pathways of um, success or failure? Um, many of you have heard uh, the, uh, uh, the presentation about we have type one and type two thinking. You know, type one are things that we sort of uh, inculcate into our uh, daily reflexes. It's, you know, fast answers to things we see often. And that this has the advantage that we don't have to go through a thinking path uh, and, and also that we can perform extremely well if we pick the right pathway. Um, and then the type two thinking, which has the advantage that it, it forces us to go back and reason through things. And it's really much more effective for uh, complex situations where there is not an immediate reflex result. And of course you can see the way either of these two processes can go wrong. But uh, this is not, the type one, type two thinking is only one of, I think, uh, uh, an entire bouquet of different possible pathways to doing the wrong thing. Uh, one that I know impacts me tremendously and also when I sit you know, on the phone and listen to um, uh, adverse uh, uh, event reports come in to the insurance company where I work, um, taking your eye off the ball is an important pathway. Um, th there's also just lapses. I, you know, I forgot, I spaced it, I didn't think. Um, this may come from attention deficit. You know, I get distracted, yes, of course. Uh, but also sometimes uh, intentions decay, right? There's a natural decay curve as our memory, short-term memory gets replaced, you know, uh, first in, first out, there are these cognitive biases, and I'm going to make fun of them in a minute, but they're real. Uh, and of course, they're just simply motor slips. Uh, you know, occasionally we pick up our coffee cup and, and drop it. Um, let's talk about this cognitive bias thing. Uh, the, a lot of folks talk about error pathways and uh, zoom heavily into um, the biases and uh, most medical residents uh, at some point in their um, training have have been exposed to a theory that um, there are uh, forces to be aware of. There are dark forces working inside your cortex um, that want to pull you off of the, the, the correct path and push you into error. And uh, it turns out that there are over 180, probably more than that, but uh, there, there are a couple of papers that list a large number of named cognitive biases. That, uh, I will make fun of this now, get ready, um, that there's, there's a bias for every graduate student who wrote a paper on some kind of a bias because they needed to, to name it. And, uh, the, the research is on so purportedly on brain mechanisms, but we don't have a you know a CAT scan that can look into your brain and see which bias is working. So actually, these are descriptive uh, categories. They they're simply labels. They don't really pertain to any brain neurological mechanism. Um, and then the the problem about this is okay, it's fine. So there, it, it's kind of like saying, well, you blink when I throw dust in your eyes. Okay, great, uh, but is there a way to mitigate that and not do it? Because these biases are 
uh, you know, operating at uh, subcognitive levels. They may be even at subconscious levels. There are anti-biasing uh, techniques, and I'll talk about those in a minute. But uh, you know, this business of patting your pocket, you know, to, to know if your car keys are there when you go out the door. These are um, procedures that we can do to avoid some of the pitfalls of lapsing, decay, distraction, and so on. But the problem is that uh, there's a dilemma here. When you do bias checking or anti-bias checking, uh, uh, you know, one check would be, um, did I really go through all of the lab and review everything? Uh, you know, because that would avoid um, a, a bias, a, a confirmation bias potentially, or an, um, an absence bias. The problem is that that takes a fragment of our working memory. So it actually takes away from our thinking about the problem to think about thinking about the problem, right? Uh, metacognition. Here's something I didn't know. I'm just going to pass this on. All of you guys might know this already yourselves, in which case, forgive me for being old. But when I went to school, we were taught there was a thing in the back of the head called the cerebellum and that the main function of the cerebellum was to coordinate movement and to, to have a smoothing effect on uh, motor actions. And I uh, went for 30 years in medical practice thinking that that, that was true. But uh, there is some literature, and uh, you should go look for it, um, that actually has located uh, some cortical connections down to the cerebellum that are not uh, motor, but are actually frontal lobe calculation and memory and other kinds of functions. And there is a, a thought, neurologists sent me straight, you know, send me an email afterward if I'm wrong. There's some thinking that the, the cerebellum actually, actually has a function in the smoothing of cognitive processes, uh, lining up tasks, um, ordering uh, plans, uh, figuring out priorities, what to do first. And so it isn't just you know, throwing a baseball that the cerebellum helps us with, but it's uh, prescribing a dose of antibiotics. This is cool. I just mentioned it for that reason. We'll go on. So here, look, this is my cartoon. It's downloadable of the 180 odd cognitive biases. And the, the humor for me about this, I, I show this to medical students and I say, here, you memorize this and you'll never make a mistake. Just see all of these, don't do them. Um, and that, you know, that's my frustration with the cognitive bias analysis of error mitigation, it just doesn't uh, seem to do enough. Um, it doesn't get me where I need to go. It's a nice analytic framework, I guess, if you're a, a neurology researcher. Okay, um, let me go to some of the, the causes that I've talked uh, about, uh, uh, that I've uh, analyzed myself in, in looking at cases that I don't think are just pure cognitive biases. Here's, here's one, which is what I call attention overload disorder, right? Um, you can force attention deficit on people that don't even have that character trait by just putting too many tasks in, in front of us. And the, the classic one is you can't text while driving. Um, uh, this brings up to me one of my favorite challenges, which is, so who says that you can text while practicing medicine? Uh, what makes you think that you can sit in front of your computer display and type and look at lab and check orders and check your email and watch YouTube videos, you know, of dancing squirrels while you're trying to interview a human being in the room with you? I don't think you can. And I think that it leads to crashes the same way as it does when you're driving and texting. Obviously, fatigue is critical in healthcare, and there's a lot of work done on this. You know, the military has done a ton of work on, on the adverse effect of fatigue and performance, but uh, we haven't because we have, you know, sort of a uh, magic powers uh, superhero uh, um, complex that um, still convinces a lot of us that we can perform uh, under conditions where um, the FAA would yank your pilot's license. Uh, 
if this is true, that uh, after 17 hours on the job, you have a level of alcohol that would get you uh, arrested in, you know, some states, you know, that means that if, if you're too tired to drive home, what have you been doing the last few hours on your shift? You're not competent. Um, that's just another challenge. Then there's this other thing. We know that healthcare itself is intrinsically difficult, right? There, there are things that raise our performance demand. And here is a list of some of them. Um, with that last one, illness, that isn't illness in the patient, it's illness in us. You know, we get ill and we come to work ill. And uh, so a lot of these things I think are interference factors. They're just enemies on the battlefield. There, you will see that there is a sentiment in uh, some organizations uh, to do um, resilience training, right? That oh, this to me is a, a form of victim blaming. We we want to go out to our our, our clinical staff and say, um, you know, it's your own health you need to take care of. How about yoga? <laughs> you know, would that work? Um, eat broccoli. And, and then you'll be tougher, and then we can abuse you as much as we want with, with a very hostile, difficult, challenging system, you know, and you'll just be able to uh, produce more. And that's where I get this notion of, uh, you, you know, we're trying to be helpful here, but you guys are down in the basement pulling on oars, and we don't have really anything to offer you about system change. What we can do is to tell you, um, uh, you could be tougher. And, and I, I do see that a lot in this so-called resilience training. And so I'm gonna challenge the system and say, uh, that isn't, uh, resilience is not gonna be enough. And in fact, uh, some of us uh, rebel a bit when we're told, uh, be smarter, try harder. Um, the, where I get this is that there are intrinsic hazards of medicine, right? There are the things we signed up for with a job. We knew this when we, we filled in our medical school application, that there were things simply about healthcare that did demand that we bring our best game and, uh, and, and they're not preventable. They, uh, grief is not, loss, anxiety, uncertainty, uh, interruptions, the fact that babies are born at night, like that's terrible. I did OB for many years and I thought that was something that somebody should look into. Um, and sustained concentration, right? Which is very exhausting. So those are intrinsic and that's where the broccoli and yoga come in. I think you simply need to be a, a person with enough internal resources that you can respond to that and bear with it. Um, but a lot of the hazards that cause issues for us as performers, I think are extrinsic. They are not, things about that are inevitable about the nature of healthcare. There are things that could be fixed in the system. These are systemic, organizational, institutional uh, burdens. And the, the, the main one of those, if, if you look at uh, um, research on Wall Street, you're looking at business, I, I don't think this has been done in healthcare, if someone find it. If you look at why people quit their job in uh, industry, it, the predominant reason is their boss is terrible. Uh, you know, that may be true or not true. It could be just a perception. But bad boss is one of the leading championship uh, uh, reasons why people find their job is uh, stressful. But there's another concept. I don't know where this actually fits, so I threw it in here. Uh, throughout the history of risk management and, you know, blame management and error and, and, you know, criminal or accidental liability, there's this concept of an act of God. It's something we are not responsible for, right? It, it, no one could foresee that a tornado, you know, would knock down your fence. And this is an, uh, an old uh, medieval almost tradition in the law. We do recognize there are such things. We occasionally can do a malpractice defense based on the unforeseeability of something, you know, anatomic variance, physiological, uh, you know, variance, genetic variance. Uh, but uh, in general, juries sort of expect us to be able to adapt to those things. And so for the most part, as a malpractice defense, 
this isn't great, but, but it does exist sometimes. Um, another causal pathway, and this is the, where we get into sort of electronic issues and systems errors, we can set up a system that is inherently error prone, failure prone, right? This, this is what reasons latent error, right? It, it is a, a circumstance that is set up for failure. And here's, there's a million of these, they're kind of humorous. Uh, uh, there's one on the left. I'm gonna constantly be coming back to the EMR because catastrophically poor uh, user interface design in the EMR is absolutely, uh, a source of system failure. And I have been counting, you know, my job is risk management for IT. So I have been looking at uh, the ways that electronic systems uh, create errors and hazards for patients and injuries. Um, I've been doing that since EMRs were invented. Um, but not just EMRs, well, you know, here, this is sort of the classic pull something out of the cabinet and shoot it into the patient. Um, my wife uh, works in a, a locked environment. Uh, she, she's a nurse practitioner, works in a prison. And they had an occasion uh, a couple of years ago where everybody was supposed to get a flu shot. This is germane, you know, this month. Let's all go get a flu shot. So what they did was they sent a nurse to the refrigerator and they had 100 staff members all lined up. They really took off, you know, a little bit of work rotating. Line up, you're getting your flu shot this morning. Fantastic. We're in a locked environment. And we're all going to give 100 injections to these people as fast as we can. The nurse uh, went into the refrigerator and pulled out a bottle of insulin instead of influenza vaccine. They both start with I. What's the difference? Gave 10 units of insulin um, IM to 100 people. And they had a really interesting morning in an environment where there are, you know, there is no orange juice. There is no, you know, candy machine. Um, this was pretty interesting and challenging. Um, and here, you know, you see uh, another one of Reason's latent error situations with a bunch of similarly labeled uh, bottles. And we do see this as an error pathway. You're going to the very, very top uh, level, um, talking about so-called system failure. I just, I have this around. It's probably not even true. This is the healthcare system, right? Some Someone actually, a staff, a, a, um, a congressional staff person actually drew this for somebody back when the uh, Accountable Care Act was being debated in Congress. You know, some somebody said to their staff, well, I'm not really sure I, I have a complete picture of the healthcare system. And so, so they made this. I love this. Um, the, the challenge for me on the, uh, you know, first of all, this is really interesting. Even, even though I, I can't believe that it's true, no one would know it's true. Who could proofread this? There's no one competent to know if it's true. But, but also, what the, the thing that's so interesting is these lines, these pipelines that go from one entity to another. This is just the flow of, of money for the most part. It's not the flow of information or authority of those other flows. But when you look at this, you, you could ask yourself, what could possibly go wrong? And the answer is, well, just about anything. So I, the thing, I don't like the, uh, the, the deal about syst blaming systems, though, I don't, um, system failure, as if it were simply, you know, act of God or uh, bad doctor or um, uh, poor training, lack of education. It, 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 there are no solitary linear explanations for anything that's interesting. We rarely get one answer. And so simply saying, oh, well, another system, we didn't email the result to the patient and though they have cancer. It, yeah, but that generality is never gonna be enough for a complete analysis. So I, I talked about attention deficit. You've all uh, heard about these uh, um, issues of, uh, distraction, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, failures. There are a lot of ways to distract the working memory and, um, and uh, cognitive processing uh, loop. And I, so I'm gonna show you, you've seen uh, this famous uh, uh, case, right? That the psychologist did the, the gorilla 
example. So the, the, the job here is you're, you're following the, the woman with the basketball and she's passing the basketball to partners. And, and this guy walks through the, the scene with an umbrella and you don't see it, you know, because you're paying attention to the basketball. This is the actual gorilla example. The guy in a gorilla suit walks through. It's kind of cute. You've seen this. Here, I'll, I'll show you uh, just one more. Here, w watch this one because uh, it's, it's kind of amusing. And, and your assignment is count the players in white passing the ball. So here, here are your players. Okay. And there they go. Okay, so, you know, I can occasionally get the 16. And if you were primed properly, you saw the gorilla, right? Interestingly, about 50% of people with no priming miss the gorilla. Okay, so did you see the curtain change color? Did you see the black shirted player walk out? Look, here, watch this. Here we go. Here comes the gorilla. I bet a lot of you saw that one, but the curtain changed color. And at the same time the gorilla came on, the black shirted person left the scene. So what this means is that when you're looking really, really hard uh, for the you know cystic duct, you may miss the cystic artery. <laughs> or, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is one of the things that contributes to what I call the fog of the examining room, okay? That the both people, the, the patient and the doctor, are subject to this kind of distraction when they're trying to have a conversation about a problem. They're both concentrating carefully, but they skip critical stuff. It's very common for patients to leave the examining room. And, you know, doctors, I have many times, you have probably, um, not getting something done that you really brought in at the tip of your mind. Oh yeah, I have to be sure to do this. And that may either distract you from something incredibly important that you should have picked up, or um, you may actually miss the primary goal of the meeting because something very distracting walked through the scene. This is uh, the challenge to visit effectiveness, right? Something that we should be measuring um, and asking patients about. Not satisfaction. I don't care, you know, yeah, okay, patient satisfaction. That's lovely. We like the, um, you know, the furniture in your examining room. But, but that's not the question. The question is, was this encounter effective? And one of the reasons for lack of effectiveness is that well, we don't follow a very clear plan. And, and it's not always our fault. If the patient gets chest pain in the middle, then that's a good time to depart. So apart from what happened, it's hard to talk about why it happened. It's even harder, right? Because the names we use for what, you know, like um, uh, wrong side surgery uh, is also a uh, name for why. Uh, why is the patient uh, unhappy? You know, or why did I not communicate to you because um, of miscommunication? So the, the language we use to talk about causes and types is overlapping. And this leads to a lot of confusion about what, which zone are we in? I, I want to just uh, make one editorial comment about root cause. A lot of people who do error analysis don't like the term root cause because it implies that a root is a carrot, that you know it's one big thick thing and you find a root cause and you go home. And in most error analysis, uh, it turns out that the roots are much more like uh, 
uh, tree or like that system, you know, healthcare system uh, diagram. It's really complicated. And what you'll find is that there may be more than one excitatory pathway operating at a time. They can work in parallel, carrying different kinds of signals and often even competing. There are, you know, enhancing and suppressing pathways as well. It's like a nervous system. And so, you know, calling it a root cause takes us back to, you know, a medieval concept of guilt and innocence, you know, like you're, you're either a guilty person or an innocent person. And it is never that simple for most of the errors we see in healthcare. But of course that confronts us with the culture. We, some of us work in organizations that have more or less of a blaming culture that, that we still keep that, that ancient, you know, sort of pre-medieval, um, it's a, a prehistoric sentiment that uh, you're a bad person if something goes wrong while you're standing near it. And that is way too unrefined for us today. Uh, that's the, the concept of disease as evil spirits, you know, invading the body. Uh, that doesn't take us anywhere. We've got to be more um, sophisticated than that. And uh, one way that we can express how sophisticated we are is to remember the tremendous value of errors. Uh, here, here are, you know, catecholamines. We love these. What, 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 the value of adrenaline, you know, or, you know, steroid surge when we've done something wrong. Think of something that you did really wrong or saw terribly go went wrong. And think of what that does to your, you know, spinal mechanism. It's like touching a hot stove. It's incredibly instructive and memorable. And it reinforces memory. Remember the beginning I said, think of an error. If you capture the value of that error when it occurs, and you think of it as a precious um, uh, insight that you can share with others, and you should bring to the next m and conference, and you could talk to your friends about it, and you should tell the residents and students like, oh, for God's sake, just don't do what I did here. Listen to this example. That is one of the really most powerful teaching tools that we have in healthcare, and we should be exploiting it to the fullest. The problem is if you go back to shame and blame, we are all inhibited from sharing some of our most sensitive errors. And that's because uh, we have a culture where it's very hard to find a sanctuary of safety for not only saying, oh God, you know, I, I operated on the wrong eye this morning. Uh, I don't even know I have to think about that, but, but we have to have the collegiality and support structure that says, oh no, tell me about that. Sit down a second here, let's close the door. Uh, are you okay? Can I help? And that would be the right reaction. Besides putting it in the database and then counting how many times we do that and figuring out why. I love this. This is an actual, uh, you know, real life shot of an emergency department with a really smart couple of docs. And they have created the anti-interruption barrier. The, the, the culture in this emergency department is while we're running the board, no nurse may come up. There's the death penalty for nurses that interrupt this team while they are doing the handoff during ship change. And uh, it's a little bit melodramatic, but it indicates a respect for the fact that there are some processes that are delicate and fragile and require everybody's cognitive attention and must not be interrupted, you know, uh, unless whatever rabid bats are in the room or, 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 or something. So I'm just kind of going to finish up here with a little bit of very fast, um, you know, psychology 101. And you don't have to spend a lot of attention to this. I just want to show you that this material is available uh, for people who want to dig a little bit deeper into this stuff. Um, there are some pretty good papers that describe several stages in how we um, process information and carry out activities. So looking at the pre-attentive stage, you know, this is before, uh, you know, this is while we're driving and before the, the deer runs across the road or before we see our exit sign. Well, we're just processing raw sensory input. 
you know, okay, here comes another patient. I guess I have to go into room three. There's, there's not much thinking going on. It's, it's, it's automatic. There's a very large capacity. You know, you can see I could, there's room three, there's room six, there's room nine. You know, the football game is on the TV downstairs. It's all really wonderful. Um, but once we walk in the room and we have to start thinking about a problem or the patient collapses in front of us in the restaurant, uh, now all of a sudden we're in focus, right? There is a focus of attention. Things that catch our attention, you know, are big and moving and, you know, shiny objects and, and the things that mostly, remember the, the gorilla business, things that mostly attach, attach our attention uh, uh, are things that we expect. Uh, it's really hard to respond to, you know, like a bird flying through the, the OR. That's weird. Um, but things that interfere with busy attentive, the focal stage, are uh, things that don't look like what they're supposed to. Uh, competing, you know, like poor vision, fog, uh, glare, noise, background noise, confusion, people, three-year-olds pulling on your, you know, your arm, and, and also things that go fast. The, here's the trick. We, we have to transfer information from short-term into long-term uh, memory or, or into focal attention memory. Um, the short-term memory is incredibly cool, but very, very limited. It, it has a very low capacity. It's good for stuff, you know, like writing down a phone number or the, the hematocrit was uh, 29, you know, and so you're thinking, okay, got to do something, got to do something. But it is, it is easily overwritten by new stuff. The hematocrit's 29, the potassium is, um, you know, 2.6, and the blood pressure is uh, 2,000, and the, the patient weighs 800 pounds, and there's a football game, and, you know, so the, the short-term memory is kind of indiscriminate, and it reacts to all kinds of input, um, including those little things, the, the jingles we're telling ourselves, like, uh, remember the hematocrit, remember the hematocrit, you know, like, what was that, you know, Okay, okay. Hey, their heart stopped. I, I know, I know, but there's a hematocrit. Um, it's also fragile. It's subject to impairment by all kinds of things. Um, and so, it, it, although it's incredibly crucial part of the, the system, we see a lot of processing problems happen when something bumps short-term memory. So what we do is we dip into long-term memory for stuff like, oh, 29, that's a, a number. Uh, what does that really mean? Let me reach into long-term memory and figure out if 29 is a good hematocrit or a bad hematocrit. Not sure. Let's see. Where is hematocrit located? And so we, we dip into our long-term memory, memory of experience, memory of rules, memory of you know, past situ similar situations. And that's how we make use of what's happening in short-term memory. And doing this is sort of like the executive function. The problem is that when we have to switch back and forth between these different modes, you know, short-term, long-term, immediate attention, rule-based memory, other kind of guidelines, um, that sort of stuff, the rules I'm telling myself to remember the rules, there is an energy demand and it, it does reduce processing power. You just think about the different kind of thinking you have to do to solve you know, a crossword or to read a book. They, they both need working memory, but they use it very differently. Another thing about working memory is that you really have to update it quite frequently uh, from the executive department in order to make sure that you retain stuff in there. And that's where technology can sometimes help because it does give us alerts, alarms, reminders, prompts, guidelines, flowcharts. Um, these are refreshments. Uh, for working memory. But of course, there are things that break it. Remember, it's fragile. And uh, one thing that really messes with our ability to move things between the parts of our uh, cognitive system are irritations. And if there's one thing that healthcare systems are great at, it's providing interruptions. Uh, when one is building a a culture of safety, one of the things that's really necessary is to shelter people that have to be using their working memory uh, from stuff like their
pager going off. Uh, so we have this, you know, we call it alarm fatigue. It's, it's a valid concept, but you can see that there's a lot more uh, that goes into it from uh, simply a numeric overload. It's not just a volume problem. Uh, alarm fatigue reaches deeply into uh, to, to cause um, actual malfunctions of some of the cognitive systems that we're trying to use. And so, you know, thank you for the alarms. Yeah, we do need that, but we're going to need to find a way to deliver those at times and in ways that don't break other systems. You know, then we, of course, we see this problem that, that has not really, really been addressed very much in the literature that I see. But the fact that when you're using a motor system to start typing orders into a computer, even you know, handwriting turns out to be a completely different part of the, the motor cortex than the typing or the mousing uh, uh, systems. And it, it turns out that voice thinking, we, we all experience, you know, misspeaking, saying something we didn't mean to because the, the mouth and the brain, you know, we, the, the tongue gets disconnected from the brain. We, we see that. It's dementia. I have it. You know, it, it happens. Um, but there's also uh, other motor, not just the tongue, but the, the hand, the eye, the, uh, the feet. You know, can you walk and chew gum? It's a big joke, but the fact is those are two different processes. And the demands of data entry do interfere with cognitive processing. They can also help it, you know, like making notes, making written notes, handwritten notes while you're in, in, you know, calculus class. They help reinforce memory. But of course, they shove other things out of the way. It's a trade-off. Where are we headed in terms of note-taking? I'm just going to, this is from, you know, the technology uh, department. Um, this was like years ago. This must be almost 10 years old. Here's Google Glass. Here's a doctor with the real-time recording of audio video uh, in the examining room, uh, who is trying to do a notes-free uh, encounter with a patient. And, and the, the claim here, the fantasy is that if I'm not typing, I may be a better doctor. I might be able to deliver more attention into the, the human uh, encounter. And uh, although nobody's using Google Glass anymore that I know, this is absolutely coming. This is where we're headed now. Um, this is an exam room with no computer, no keyboard, no mouse, no screen. It just has this HAL thing on the wall. And I, I this is a mock-up. The HAL isn't really on the wall. This was a demo that I saw from Nuance, the Dragon uh, speech recognition company. And they really are demoing this. This is kind of available now, coming soon to uh, an exam room near you. Um, this is a recorder that is doing real-time audio video in multi-channels with extremely hypersensitive uh, microphones. Probably they could count the respiratory rate of everybody in the room. And video uh, analysis of uh, the, the lips moving and the other gestures happening within the room. So the dragon can detect which party in the room is speaking, even if everybody's talking at the same time. They have to put this in a cocktail party, and they can separate five different people yelling at each other and assign the speech, the utterances, to the proper person by doing voice recognition and uh, moving lips recognition. Imagine this in your uh, exam room, recording the exam. You don't need to type. It knows what you did. It knows what the patient said. It knows what you said and did and ordered and examined. And it produces, this is the brilliance of this, I won't go into it much, it produces not a transcript, not a court transcript, because that would be disgusting. You know, who wants like a 500-page view of our, our exam? What it does is it writes up a summary using artificial intelligence and gives you a visit note, you know, that basically is in the format you would write. You know, this is a 32-year-old woman who comes in with knee pain, and I saw this and did this and ordered this and, and you know, goodbye. And then it prints it out at the end of the visit so that the patient takes it and you take it, and the orders are already put into the pharmacy, and the x-ray is down the hall. That we are definitely going here. Um, and, you know, will this help? What new errors will arise? I don't know. Okay, we're going to wrap up with just a couple more 
uh, pictures, and then I, I may have time for some questions. Um, diagnostic error is uh, a focus of uh, intense uh, uh, attention and concern. It should be because it is claimed that a lot of what we do wrong in healthcare really comes from misdiagnosis. But uh, I find this uh, book, th this is from the Institute of Medicine a, a couple of years ago. They did do a review of diagnostic error. And I found that it was a very good effort, but I don't think it, it made it over the bar for me because in a lot of ways, it lumped too many things in as diagnostic error. Uh, for example, the case of the um, mislabeled uh, biopsy specimens where uh, one patient who had a normal prostate uh, ended up with a diagnosis of cancer and went in for and got a radical prostatectomy. And the other patient that had the cancer uh, was ignored for two years. And that's a real case. Um, that was labeled in some analyses as a diagnostic error. And well, you know, I, I forgive you for calling it that, but really no. That is not the kind of cognitive pathway that I'm thinking of. Something else went wrong in the, the biopsy suite. Uh, it was, you know, a medical assistant put the wrong bit of tissue in the wrong bucket. So let's be careful when we dig into diagnostic error, and, uh, but do do it. Um, here's an emergency. It is said that in emergency room, diagnosis error is one of the main problems categorically uh, that cause adverse outcomes in the ED. And, and these guys wrote a paper that thought, uh, that actually challenged that it's not so much process, but it's actually knowledge-based, that, that the ED docs sometimes don't know stuff or don't follow um, uh, guidelines that they do know. I'm gonna zip through, I'm, I'm just about done. We want to be a high performance court culture. If we look at other high performance cultures, what we see is that there are uh, absolutely some guidelines that they use for how they manage uh, teams that we don't do very well in uh, healthcare. My last kind of wisecrack will be that in general, I would say the slower doctor is the better doctor. You need to have a certain pace and tempo uh, in your practice in order to carry out the complicated tasks, the uh, very high co cognitive burden uh, tasks that we ask you to deal with. And what that means is that in many environments, there is a uh, pressure to perform at a, at a tempo that does not allow quality to occur. Let's just park that as a thought. There are habits of safety. Um, you know, the, here are some. There are other habits that can make us smarter and can avoid uh, the other sources of error um, that we run into in healthcare. And I encourage people to think about examples of ways they can build habits and automate uh, safety systems. Okay, so let's see, I'm gonna finish. I'm getting near the end of time. Uh, horrible boss. Still the worst thing, you know, terrible environment, production pressure, metrics that are unreasonable, uh, incentives that are uh, inappropriate, uh, fatigue, giving up, you know, these are uh, cultural and, and organizational problems. And I'm going to, I'm emphasizing these as some of the main problems that I see as base uh, causes uh, where, uh, uh, errors take root and begin to arise. Um, the be smarter, try harder in, uh, uh, injunction is no use to me, but we do have incentives, simulations, guidelines, uh, their uh, liability risk, yes, that, that's a, a piece of the puzzle. Alerts, reminders, although we make fun, yes, they're valuable. Coaching, supervision, all of this contributes to a culture. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously there's more to say. I'm going to quit there. Um, you have my contact information. I'm happy to take questions if we have any time for some. Um, you know, otherwise, please.
please let me know if this is helpful or send me your stories because I live on stories. Okay. Whoever is moderating, um, if you're watching, take off. Let's see, I'm going to end my own screen sharing from here.